In late October of 2021, there was a major breakthrough. You'll hear Major's Leet speak username a lot in the PS3 scene. Major is a freaking wizard. He reversed the syscon and found that the RSX core and VRAM clock frequencies can be manipulated in level 1.self. It was on his radar at least as far back as 2019 on developer consoles, but it took another two years before he became the first person to actually overclock the RSX on a retail PS3. Over the next few months, he and Proto did a lot of tests to find an overclock that is safe for all consoles. Then Zico Shao released the modified level 1.self to PSX place. That's what Nate uses in his overclocked Evil Nat custom firmware. 600 core, 700 VRAM, which is plus 100 megahertz on both. Thanks to their contributions, overclocking the PS3 has become as easy as jailbreaking and installing an update. But I don't want to stop there. I want to see how far I can push it. Enthusiasts can create our own overclocked firmware using a program called Modified Firmware Builder. MFW for short, that hacks and maintains on GitHub. With that, I can make my own modified firmware with any clock frequency combination. Let's see if we can tip the balance back in favor of the PS3. Credit and thanks for MFW Builder goes to Bits Bubba for the original inspiration with NFW. Rest in peace, buddy. Toolboy for making the original MFW Builder, Paxson and others for developing it further, adding plugins to make it more useful, and of course, debugging it. If I'm missing anybody else, I'm sorry. My buddy NASCAR1243 and I also added a bunch more overclocking combinations to the dropdown, but others have too, so it's been a team effort. Anyway, that's how I created these. Each folder contains an EvilNAT 491.2 Beta 7 overclocked modified firmware to install any combination of core and VRAM frequencies I need. And all I have to do now is accept the extreme risk and install it. Seriously, it's extremely easy to brick your PS3 doing this. It's only for enthusiasts that are willing to brick or can use a hardware flasher to recover from it. It should go without saying, but don't think it's safe and blame me for your recklessness. You have been warned. So first thing, let's go to Haxon's GitHub page, and this can be modified firmware builder and GitHub. That should be it right there. Go to code, download zip, and it's downloaded. And then I'm just going to copy that to the desktop. Extract it. I like to extract it to a folder with the same name. Okay, so here it is. Open that up. Uh, it looks like it already has a folder, so I'll just pull that out. And we don't need those anymore. So we have modified firmware builder. First thing you need to do is open it up and then we will go down and I'm looking for a batch file. Update PS3 keys.bat. Double click that and it will open up this thing. This is to create the level one keys that we need for the overclock. So what I want to show you is in this folder here, PS3 keys, there are different firmware versions from 3.15 all the way up to, it looks like, 489. So that means if you want to install a firmware that is later than 4.89, you need to add in the key using this batch. So we need 490 and 491 since those are the most recent updates. It says, for example, type 484. See? 484. But we need 490 first. So 490. Enter. And it just created the keys in this folder. Okay? And then it needs a, a special format as well. So type 400. And in this case, 90. So 400, 90. Okay, so it added them. Okay, so let's do that one more time for 491, which will be the latest update. 491. 
and then 491. Press any key to continue, we're done. Okay, so now in the PS3 keys folder, we should have keys for 490 and 491. This is very important. Now we can open up this executable here. We'll just open it as an administrator. And here it is. And there's a few things we have to do in here. The first thing we need to do is go over here to settings. Okay. And here under PS3 keys, we have to find that folder. I put it on the desktop. So, so desktop modified firmware builder. PS3 keys. Okay. And then hit save and it will reload. All right. Now we need to select the original firmware that we want to modify. So we'll hit browse. I want to modify EvilNAT 491, go to PS3, update, and grab the pup. That's what you need. Okay, and under modified firmware, this is the folder that you want to save it to. So I'm just going to save this to the desktop. And I'm going to call it 600 750. So that's 100 megahertz on both the core and VRAM. Stock would be 500 650. So this has been tested by uh, Proto and Major to be safe on pretty much every console. Um, it's not 100% guaranteed, like if you wanted to do this on a backwards compatible model with a 90 nanometer RSX, it's kind of iffy. Sometimes you might have some issues, but it shouldn't cause a brick. Shouldn't, in air quotes. But this is where it's recommended to start overclocking. Alright, so we're going to save that. Now what we need to do is choose the base firmware. So we chose a 491. That means we need a base 4 CEX, which is a um, retail firmware. So that's the one we want to choose. And these are really important. Anything that says rebuilder, rebuilder, we have to uncheck. If you have these checked, it will brick. So do not have those checked. They're checked by default. Uncheck them. That's very important. Now down here, patch level one for RSX overclock. Check that. And over here, you will see a uh, drop down menu has appeared. And we can select the overclock from here. They go up by the RAM timing. So here's 750. And I want 600 750. Okay. Now, if I did everything correctly, all I should have to do is hit build firmware. Modified firmware built successfully. If you see this and you did everything else the same, this is safe. You're good to go. So now on the desktop, I should have a firmware. And all I have to do with this is delete that. So that says PS3 update.pup. And then we'll place that onto the USB stick in a folder called PS3. And inside that folder called update. And that's where we're going to put that. Now I'll just copy this onto my USB and then install it. All right. The first step is you're going to need a jailbroken PlayStation 3. It has to be fully jailbroken. It can't be hand. Jailbreaking is not in the scope of this video, so I recommend watching the latest Mr. Mario tutorial who does a better job at showing you everything you need to jailbreak your PS3. Okay, now that you're jailbroken, install the 6750 overclock that you just made. The idea is to attempt increasing core clocks in 50 megahertz increments first, then start testing for stability, looking for artifacting and overheating in several games designed to push the RSX. God of War Ascension, Crisis 3, The Last of Us, GTA 5, and Uncharted 2, those are all good games. Crisis HD is also another one. Note, there are some FPS mods that can be applied to make the games more stressful and hopefully expose issues. It's a good idea to push the console as hard as possible before clocking higher. If any glitching textures or flickering, rasterization effects, etc. are observed, back off the latest stable overclock. 
that's your max. If you go any higher, you may make the system so unstable it won't be able to complete an update. And the only way to go back is to complete an update. So this is a soft break. Once you've reached your highest stable core overclock, begin increasing the VRAM frequency. But be warned, VRAM increases cause more subtle artifacts, if at all, like tiny speckles of black or pinpricks of white, but often it causes freezing without warning. It can go from fully stable in-game at, say, 900, to a soft brick at 950, whereas at 925 it might only freeze after 5 minutes in certain games and not show any artifacts. Be extra careful for signs of VRAM instability. For example, my console was fully stable at 975 MHz, but impossible to use at 1000. It couldn't complete the update process even in safe mode. It was nearly bricked. Core increases cause more obvious artifacts, like glitching textures and black square patches. Here's what to do if it breaks. Wait about an hour for the console to fully cool. Point a fan at the console to keep it cool for as long as possible. Attempt to update from safe mode. Use Syscon UART to adjust the fan table to 100%, and that may make it stable enough to complete an update, but it might take multiple attempts to get it to work. If neither of those things will work, you're going to have to use a hardware flasher like a TNC2++, E3 NOR flasher, or a FlashCat export to restore the flash image that was previously saved. This is why you need to keep that backup, but this is an advanced method and very difficult. Once you've reached your highest stable overclock, it's possible to increase the voltage to push the console even further. But the temps will increase quickly, and it's harder on the power delivery system. Warning! Increasing voltage is very risky. Do not attempt unless you are willing to accept the risk. You, and you alone, are responsible for the consequences. Alright, vCore VID hacking. Required. You're going to need a multimeter to measure your core voltage. You'll need Syscon UART access. And you'll need VID tables to set the correct VID byte in Syscon EEP ROM. To change the core voltage, we need to change a byte in Syscon EEP ROM that sets the voltage ID we want. Basically, this value tells the Syscon which binary to send to the buck controller, which in turn sets the voltage. So it requires Syscon access to both change the byte and then fix the checksum. I've already made a Syscon UART tutorial to gain access, and you need to know how to do that before you can do this. So go figure out how to do that before coming back. Next, go to my GitHub, linked in the description, and download the VID tables. If you're going to attempt this on a Mullion Syscon, you need to download the Mullion VID table. If you're going to attempt it on a Sherwood Syscon, like I will here, then download the Sherwood VID tables. This spreadsheet has a list of voltages and corresponding hex values we need to set the desired voltage. But before we can start increasing it, we need to know what our default value is. I couldn't find a reliable way to determine it without having to open the console. So disassemble and measure the voltage of your RSX V-Core. I like to measure it here, at the caps leading into the RSX. As you can see, mine was 0.966 volts. Write this down. The buck controller receives a 6 or 8 bit binary code from the syscon. That determines the voltage. In my 2501A console, I scoured away the solder mask and measured the VID itself as an example. You don't need to do this. 0 volts is 0. 3.3 volts is 1. So my VID was 0110. 0110. That's the 8-bit binary being sent to the ISL6325 buck controller used on this motherboard. It looks up the code and selects the voltage according to its VID table, which can be found in the datasheet of the ISL6326, which is the closest one publicly available. My VID binary corresponds to 0 0.9750 volts but that's a bit higher than the 0.966 volts I actually measured. So there's a bit of a voltage drop with real-world measurements. Keep that in mind. Now I know where to start. So open the VID table spreadsheet you downloaded. Here's my Sherwood table. Go down the list of voltages until you find one that's close to the value you measured. It looks like mine would be 0.96875 volts. So here's the approach I took to stabilizing my overclocks. I selected a voltage that was 
0.25 volts higher, which was pretty close to one volt. So I decided that would be a good place to start. The hex value for one volt on Sherwood is 5F. The process for selecting voltage on Mullion is the same, except to use the other VID table. Now we need to actually write this value to the Syscon EEP ROM. Since my 2501A has a Sherwood Syscon, the command I needed to increase my voltage is write 51 5F. If you have a Mullion Syscon, the address is 3111 instead of 51. And you would use the hex value from the Mullion VID table instead of the Sherwood tables. For example, if I wanted one volt on the RSX on a motherboard that has a Mullion Syscon, I would use the command write 3111 23. For Mullion syscons, you need internal access to write commands in this way. In external mode, you would have to use the command EEP set instead. But if you're going this far, you really should have enabled internal access by now. Now I need to fix the checksums so that the console will start correctly. Sherwood doesn't work like Mullion. After entering the command EEP CSUM, it'll say something like CSUM equals C9E3. So this is what I need to fix the checksum with, but it doesn't tell you the address to fix. Instead, Sherwood has one address for the entire EEP ROM. It's always 7FE. So you just have to remember that. In my case, the command to fix the checksum is write 7FE E3HC. Remember to byte swap this value. If you have issues with the console shutting off or triple beeping in standby, this could be why. Double check you fix the checksum correctly then move on. That's it. The overvolt should be applied. Measure the voltage again just to be sure it's increased by the expected amount, but remember that it'll read a bit lower than the set point value in the VID table. In my case, the multimeter read 0.992 volts instead of 1 volt, but that's about 0.025 volts more than it was before, which is what I expected. That's it. Now repeat your testing procedure looking for graphical artifacts and see if the voltage increase helped to stabilize the overclock. If it's better, but not quite stable, you can repeat the incremental increases until it is. But beware that doing this increases the voltage ripple and noise. Eventually, you'll reach a limit and it'll cause a yellow light of death or a no light of death. In my case, it caused A080-1002 errors, which was due to the filter capacitors not being able to keep the voltage clean and smooth. Overvolting can expose their wear. It's possible that the voltage regulation module itself isn't able to deliver the current needed for the resulting overvolt. So it might also cause that error. Just be aware that you will reach a design limit at some point. And of course, doing this will shorten the life of the console. This is only for enthusiasts who accept that risk and want to see how far they can push the limits. The last thing I want to mention is that if you need to revert back to stock, the default value is FF. So change the byte at the address 51 or 311 back to FF, and that will revert to the default voltage. Okay. In this tutorial, I showed you how to create your own overclocked custom firmware, what instability to look for to determine your maximum stable overclock, hopefully without breaking. I gave you some tips and tricks to unbreak, and finally, showed you psychos how to voltage mod the core to achieve a higher stable overclock. But you might be wondering why I didn't show you how to voltage mod the VRAM. And what about performance of our overclocked PS3? Could it actually outperform the Xbox 360 and redefine the seventh generation console war? Well, there's a lot more to this journey I couldn't show here. Stay tuned for my next video where I deep dive into the voltage mods and put the overclocked PS3 to the ultimate test. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. Until then, here's a taste. Bro, every multi-platform game runs better on Xbox better frame rates, and sharper picture. You must be high! That's because of lazy developers making crap ports. If they optimized the game for PS3, Sony would blow Microsoft out of competition. Literally all you have to do is put a game in both consoles. The difference is obvious. The PS3's literal supercomputer. Late to the party, whining about scraps. Get in the game, party pooper, or shut the- <laughs>